Thank you, Pippa. <laughs> Hi. Um, I haven't decided if I want to stand or sit. I think I'm going to sit because that feels more like story time or something like that. <laughs> um, right, um, let me put this down here. Um, it's such an honor to be kicking off this inaugural um, talk at the very first Realization Festival. And I just want to acknowledge once again what was already said yesterday um, about how we've all just come out of this, this very intense period, lockdown. We may not have been in these kinds of spaces. Um, and you know, thank you so much to Pippa for just making everyone aware that we're, we're, we're doing a lot of talking this morning. But um, I still really hope that this will feel um, just like a, a, a conversation, you know, a dialogue. Um, and yeah, we're, we're here to share experiences, as, as Jonathan mentioned yesterday. Um, but I think, you know, we want to, we want to share experience with intentionality. Um, and this morning, we're going to be uh, thinking about the role of beauty um, on learning and reimagining beauty in society. Um, and there is a lot of purpose and intentionality with that um, because you know, there's a, there's a need to beautify the, the crises that we face. Um, but I would like to start with sharing a little bit about myself um, in the spirit of sharing experience. Um, and I'm really looking forward to moments during the, the festival when we all get to know each other a little bit better. But um, I'll kind of uh, kick that off with um, sharing about myself and, uh, and how I kind of came to doing the work that I do and, um, and to exploring topics like, like beauty. Um, so one thing about me that I can start by sharing is that I've always felt like I, I never quite fit in um, wherever I found myself. So I grew up in, in Lagos, in, in Nigeria, a city which I, I love. Um, I, I loved growing up there, it was really exciting. Um, but it was also a very patriarchal society. And I was, um, I was a feminist as a child already. And as I share about myself, um, you'll, you'll, you'll glean that I still very much am. Um, and I just had this sense that of injustice um, of, of the society that I lived in. Um, men were the heads of all the major institutions of government um, in, in the family. So I grew up in a family compound um, with my, my parents um, as an only child, um, but also uh, my, my dad's siblings uh, lived with us. Um, my mother is, or my mother was, my late mother was Finnish. Um, and so my household was um, inter-ethnic, inter-racial. Um, my parents met in Germany and spoke German to each other and to me. My mother and I spoke Finnish, my, my dad and I English, um, and then all of the family members around as well. My dad's Muslim, uh, my mother was Protestant. So sharing all this to say that it was an interfaith, you know, inter-ethnic, uh, really kind of mixed environment, um, but in a patriarchal country. And I felt a mismatch because of that already as a child. Um, when I was 13, we had a, um, there was a, a dictatorship in Nigeria at the time that was making life uh, very challenging and pretty much anyone who who had the means to leave Nigeria did at that time and so my mother and I moved to Sweden um, and we moved to Sweden instead of Finland because she had family there um, and in Sweden I felt again a sense of dissonance with the society that I um, that I encountered. Um, I encountered a lot of racial prejudice in the school that I went to. I was bullied. I was sometimes physically attacked as well. Um, eventually, I came to love Sweden. Um, you know, I, I lived there for 10 years. Um, and yes, but there was this sense that uh, I didn't quite fit in once again. And from Sweden, I moved to Spain and then to New York um, for a few years until moving to London, where I've lived for 15 years. And I'll just won't get into the experiences that I had in all of those places, obviously. But um, 
similarly, again, I just had this sense of not quite fitting in. Um, and it, I mean, you know, it wasn't a constant thing, but it's, it's something that I've always carried with me, um, uh, perhaps because I have all of these uh, different backgrounds. But um, I did, when I, as a, as a teenager, I first encountered um, the work of black feminists, or feminists generally, and then later of black feminists. And, um, and that was the first time for me that I, I could say that I'd found a home. You know, it was, I recognized myself in their writing, in their experiences. Um, and so, these are uh, the things that really matter to me. And I feel like it matters that I, I share that before speaking about beauty and society, um, that I, I, I come into this space um, as a feminist um, and as someone, uh, let's say, a, a, a cosmopolitan person, uh, with cosmopolitan in the kind of uh, truest sense of the term, which means uh, a world citizen and somebody who is uh, concerned about the world um, and, and fellow humans in the world. Um, I'm also here as part of the planning team um, of the Realization Festival, so I'm an associate with Perspectiva, um, who has put this together with St. Giles. Um, and so I am kind of chairing this session <laughs> um, and speaking, which I'm not necessarily accustomed to doing both, but it feels, it feels, it feels right and I hope that it will for all of you too. Um, so last year I published a book called Sensuous Knowledge, A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone. Um, and the, the, the title of my, my session here today is Sensuous Knowledge, um, I'll share a little bit about that and how that connects to, to the theme. Um, but I first just want to, to mention everybody else that's going to be speaking today. Um, so Amisha Gadiali will be speaking after me. Um, and she is the host uh, of a podcast called The Future is Beautiful. Um, she is, I mean, among very many things. Um, she's a teacher, an author, um, and I'm going to allow every speaker to introduce themselves, uh, but I just want to acknowledge um, Amisha's got a very present uh, and grounded way of speaking, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we have Bayo Akomalafe, um, who's in India, and will be joining us on the screen, on Zoom. Um, Bayo is a poet, a philosopher, a professor, a public intellectual, um, and he's just a really incredible and wise um, person and I can't wait to hear what he has to share. Um, after that we have a break and then we'll be joined by Indra Adnan, um, who is uh, someone that I've been lucky to, to work with uh, quite close in the past few months. She's, an, she's the, the founder of uh, an alternative political organization called The Alternative, um, an author, a psychotherapist, again, she'll, she'll tell you more about the very many things that she does, but um, Indra has a kind of pragmatic, utopian, um, I like to call her, her vision, um, or her cosmovision, which was a word Jonathan used yesterday that I really liked. Um, and then we have um, Masvita, where's Masvita? There, oh, sorry. <laughs> Masvita Chirimuta, who, um, whose work is so fascinating. So Masvita is a, a neuroscientist and a philosopher, and she's been working with um, the, the metaphysics of color and with subjectivity and reality, and yeah, I think uh, we're in for a treat. And, um, and then Ivo, um, who's my colleague at Perspectiva, and who is um, so many things, <laughs> we, we all wear so many hats. Ivo is a, an ordained priest in Zen Buddhism, um, among many things. He's, um, he's also been working with Perspectiva Press, um, the books are over there on the table that Ivo's helped to, to put together. Anyway, we have a, a really great um, lineup of people, so yeah. Um, sensuous knowledge. Um, a Black Feminist Approach for Everyone is a book, as a book, 
Um, it's a collection of interwoven essays about universal concepts such as beauty, power, identity, knowledge, um, etc. Written from a black feminist perspective. Um, so typically the shapers of these universal concepts that impact all of our lives have been men of European heritage. And so I was interested in what would emerge if we instead looked at these, these, these philosophical topics um, from a different lens. And so, uh, um, yeah, that's as a book, as a, as a theory, as a concept, um, sensuous knowledge is uh, an interweaving of the psychosocial and the sociopolitical, you could say, so of, of aesthetics and politics, of storytelling and academic research. And it's a kind of holistic um, mind, body, soul approach to knowledge, because I, I, I believe that um, that's one of the big challenges that we face in the 21st century is, is how we produce knowledge, so epistemology, um, and how we, we tend to do that in, in fragmented ways and that in, results in further fragmentation in society. Um, and I contrast sensuous knowledge to what I refer to as Europatriarchal knowledge, um, which is the conventional and the dominant way that we are um, educated from, from very early in life. And, um, and that is a it's, a, it's a way, the dominant way of knowledge is, um, it kind of is ro robotic and um, rigid, and it's obsessed with uh, measurement and classification and taxonomy and things like that. Things which uh, I should stress, I think are really important, you know, a lot of the kind of scientific uh, insight that we have comes from that way of thinking, but we really need to, to shift and to start to, to, to be more imaginative. Um, but when we think about beauty, uh, the, the, the conventional way, or the way that most of us tend to think of beauty, does come from this Europatriarchal approach of, of trying to measure and and classify and things like that. So um, just to give like a, a brief purview of, of how we've come to our notions of beauty, um, there's, the, there's things like concepts such as the golden ratio, um, which is really dominant in how we think of beauty. Um, and that was conceptualized already in ancient Greece, but it was popularized by a German philosopher, um, Gustav Fechner, um, another a German mathematician um, whose name escapes me. Did I write it down? Um, no, I didn't. But um, there's a, a, a formula called aesthetic measure, um, which was really influential in the, in the 19th century um, in terms of shaping beauty. William Hogarth, uh, the British critic and artist, um, to give another example, wrote a book called The Line of Beauty. And in this book, he coined uh, what he called the serpentine line. Um, and this, again, is a way, was a way of measuring beauty. Um, uh, each of these works had, you know, uh, formulas, um, things like M equals OC, and M was, you know, the the aesthetic value and OC was this and that. So, you know, really approaching beauty in this way. And then, of course, um, Immanuel Kant uh, wrote about the sublime and the beautiful. Um, and he, he said that the sublime was, you know, the kind of beauty that, that jars you. Um, and that's like, it's more magnificent somehow than the beautiful. Um, and it, I mean, if you read this essay, it's, it's hyper-intelligent, it's really compelling to read, but it's also inimically sexist. Um, you know, it's, it, it, he argues that the sublime is connected to the masculine, whereas uh, beauty is the feminine and therefore inferior. And, you know, so we're, we're, I'm sharing all this to say that we're coming from this, this lineage um, of looking at beauty in ways that are 
sexist, um, racist, of course, you know, the, the tax classification and taxonomy was used, especially during the Enlightenment, to, to kind of create rankings uh, between people. And so beauty is, is a concept that without doubt, you know, has a harmful legacy. Um, and I want to, I'm sharing this to, to kind of say that um, it's, there are, there are, there are valid reasons that maybe some of you, when you saw the program, um, might have felt like hesitation sometimes. Uh, you know, the beauty, it's, it's, it's something that has been used to oppress um, women, especially, you know, sexual objectification. Uh, feminists have traditionally taken, taken issue with beauty. Um, and, and written about things like the male gaze and, and of course a lot of criticism about the sexual objectification of women. Um, uh, and I used to be um, one of those feminists who, who sensed or who, who, um, who felt a kind of hostility toward the notion of beauty. It didn't feel like something that we could, we could use uh, to create social transformation. Um, but then I, uh, throughout the kind of challenges that I faced my life and in my life, and most especially when, when my mother passed away, I really um, found that beauty was the thing that kind of held me, you know, the beauty, beauty in the world. And I'll, I'll, I'll eventually get to trying to, to pinpoint what that is. Um, but, um, yeah, then I, I realized that beauty is, is too important. It's too, it's too fecund a notion to just give away. You know, it's, um, it's, it's something that we really can, re we can unlearn what we, how we've uh, come to see beauty and we can reimagine it as, as, a, as an instrument for change. And so this is where uh, the, the notion of doing beauty comes in, um, in, in the synopsis for, for today's session, um, we mention doing beauty. And it comes from a line in The Bluest Eye, which is a novel by uh, the African-American writer Toni Morrison. And it's um, in the novel, there's a, there's a section where the protagonist, um, who has always been, uh, she's a dark skin, African-American girl and, you know, she's been taught by her society to kind of loathe herself um, and she experiences a shift at one point of the story and she says at that point that I learned, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of, I learned that um, I could not only, beauty was not only something to see, but also something to do. Um, there's another story uh, that Toni Morrison, uh, to, to stick with, with her, um, that I'd like to share, uh, kind of anecdotally to share. Um, and it was when Toni Morrison, in her acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, uh, she told a story about an old, blind, clairvoyant woman um, and a group of youngsters who, who went up to this woman and they wanted to kind of trick her and they said one of them was holding a dead bird in his hands and he went up to the old woman and said old woman since you know how to tell the future since you can see into the future tell me what I'm holding in my hand and the old woman um, was quiet for a very long time and the youngsters started to laugh because they thought ah we got her, she doesn't know what, what's in my hand. And then she, after a long silence, the old woman said, I don't know what's in your hand, but what I do know is that it's in your hands. And I think that this story really, even though Toni Morrison wrote about these things in two different contexts, but it helps to elucidate this idea of doing beauty um, it is in our hands to reimagine beauty. It is we who, who shape it. Um, there, is no, there is no formula. And going back to trying to define beauty, I think actually that 
beauty is, is too slippery a notion to define and, and trying to define it um, kind of defies its purpose. Um, so I don't think that that's, that's what I would like to do with beauty in so far it is in, in my hands. But, but nevertheless, I, I have a sense that the reimagining of beauty is thinking about it as something that is um, anarchic almost non-conformist, wild, um, beauty, finding beauty in places where we typically wouldn't imagine to find beauty, um, which makes me think of, for instance, women in prisons um, who, uh, like one of the, 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 the most engaged parts of uh, prison life in, in women's prisons is uh, having, women have these salons, um, and makeup artists and and you know they they really they, they get together and um and they do beauty in a sense and there's no men in prisons in women's prisons obviously so that kind of instantly challenges the idea that women only perform beauty for the male gaze um you know there's something else going on there and that's only one type of beauty the kind of aesthetic and physical um i think also of beauty as tied to pleasure. Um, beauty is something that, that can bring pleasure into our lives. And I think that coming, um, uh, coming into pleasure, like br bringing pleasure into our lives is one of the kind of key, almost political acts at this point. We need to uh, individually and collectively explore how we, can, how we can feel more pleasure, because that's when we create compassion for each other. That's, that's a kind of space where life takes on meaning. Um, and there's a kind of growing body of work even in uh, evolutionary theory and biology, because you could, um, there's been arguments alongside the kind of measuring of beauty. Uh, there's a lot of sort of evolutionary arguments that uh, say peacocks, you know, they, they kind of, have this amazing uh, um, incandescent plumage in order to attract peahens. Um, but there's a growing uh, uh, canon of biologists who, um, who argue that actually uh, animals quite often just express beauty for the sake of pleasure, just for the sake of beauty in itself. Uh, and there's something about that that I think is, is quite interesting and a different way of thinking about beauty. Um, I think thinking of beauty as something secretive is quite interesting. So in the way that when we were children, um, before we you know, were told what to think was beautiful, um, I'm sure most of us have had experiences of you know, playing out in nature or, um, or wherever, and just kind of in our own minds conceptualizing beauty and keeping it to ourselves. And that kind of quality, that element is something that I um, think is, is of value, even as we do that collectively today and beyond. And lastly, um, connecting beauty to the senses. So the, the word beauty comes from the Latin belly tatem, um, which means, uh, some, it means basically bringing pleasure to the senses. Um, but the senses, of course, are the, the ones that we think of are sight, sound, touch, hearing, taste. Um, but there are up to 21 senses. Um, so for instance, the chronoception, the, the perception of time, or equilibroception, the perception of balance. Um, how would we think about beauty from the perspective of chronoception, for instance, that, that opens another portal to, to how we can reimagine beauty. And of course, all of these things um, are connected to the non-human natural world. And ultimately, um, I think that's, that's the kind of domain that we want to, to take our unlearning and our reimagining toward. I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>